Okay, so this is called an out of the box session. And what that means is that we are going to encourage you to think outside the box. Because what is quite common, especially at British schools and colleges, when you get up towards the end of your schooling, is that you get more and more refined in your skill set and your thinking by the number of A levels that you're doing. And we do a relatively small number of subjects at British schools. And that has various strengths, most obviously of which is that you develop extraordinary concentrated skill, which is fantastic and very useful for university life. The big problem, however, of course, is that it means that you might stop seeing the wood for the trees. You might be so overly focused on a particularly narrow set of disciplines that you miss the rest of the sky that could be just as important. So what we're going to talk about today, given that you're mostly social scientists and um, humanities um, students, is we're going to talk about natural sciences and how they can help us understand nothing less than the meaning of life. Now, I know that's a sort of pretty heavy topic, but it's a topic that tends to be dominated by philosophers, by artists, by writers, poets, you know, you lot, basically, <laughs> um, and, and lawyers and policymakers, you know, people who try and work out what a good life will look like in a, in a regulatory sense. So basically, us social scientists and humanities people have been dominating the conversation about what it means to live a meaningful life. And I'm going to pass it over to the natural scientists this morning and explain some of their key insights when it comes to this question. Now, please be clear that talking about the meaning of life can be quite a difficult subject to grasp in the sense that it can be quite uncomfortable to talk about whether or not life has any meaning. What I'm not going to be saying throughout this lecture is what I think makes for a good life or a bad life. I'm going to say what I think makes my life meaningful, but I'm not going to be trying to impress on you any sort of way to live. So please be very sort of open minded and careful about this. Also, when I describe theories that have been put forward by natural scientists with regards to what makes life more or less meaningful, they are just that. They're just theories. So you must take them with a big pinch of salt. I'm not trying to say to you that science has the answers to these questions and that if you are religious or if you believe in some more philosophical concept about the meaning of life that you're wrong. Absolutely not. Obviously, obviously, I don't have the answers to this. So this is just a conversation, nothing more than that. But I do feel the need to be clear because it can be quite a difficult conversation and I think it's worth being upfront about that. Right, anyway, so I'm going to share my screen so that you can see what I see and then you should be able to see some slides. Okay, here we go. So this is a picture of Jesus College in the background uh, and a fake newspaper because <laughs> I don't know why, why not? Um, so we're gonna be talking about the meaning of life. Well, um, you know, any good sort of scientific endeavor starts with good questions and question selection is essential. So even starting with the question, what is the meaning of life is in itself something that we ought to question. Why would we even ask such a bizarre question? Um, and, you know, so you need to try and unpack it in the way that a, a natural scientist would. So what is relevant? What make what is meaning? What is life? Uh, when do these concepts and phenomena begin and end? Uh, what's the point of discussing the meaning of life? Is this just some sort of silly parlor game uh, for privileged people like me? Or does this actually have any bearing on the rest of our lives? That's a really important question. You know, scientists have limited time and resources. So should they be spending their time answering frivolous questions like this? Or should they be spending more time trying to uh, interrogate pressing concerns such as how to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic? Now, it's not necessarily mutually exclusive. And I'd be inclined to argue that discussing the nature of our own sentience, our consciousness as a human being, as a species, is an essential part of of our academic enterprise. That yes, dealing with say risk mitigation when it comes to a pandemic is obviously important and valuable, but I don't think it's value less to go on a much more long-term journey to try and uncover the mysteries of our own existence. There are certainly many things that scientists do with regard to say the mysteries of outer space that have no immediate practical utility to us as a species, but nonetheless build us up because they give us a, a greater understanding of the environment we're in. So I don't think this is a pointless parlor game personally, but you are perfectly welcome to disagree. You could just think this is silly. This is a bit like playing, I don't know, trivial pursuit. It is trivial and it is a pursuit for silly people. <laughs> That's a completely respectable conclusion to, to reach. Um, we should also, of course, challenge the terms of the question. Um, you know, maybe talking about the meaning of life is fairly 
poor use of prepositions. And this is where you humanities and social scientists will come into your own because you can interrogate uses of language uh, some, often more effectively than natural scientists can. We might be better off, according to most philosophers, about talking of meaning in life rather than meaning of life. When you talk about meaning of life, it sort of objectifies it. It makes it into this sort of sense that everyone can aspire to the same meaning. If it's meaning in life, then it's how you populate your own life with something meaningful. Now, scientists can actually help us unravel both of those phenomena, the subjective and the objective. But we nonetheless need to be sensitive to how even the use of a modest uh, preposition like in or of can change fundamentally the meaning of this question. You can also, if you like, completely reconfigure the question to try and get an get to the essence of what the question is without actually using the question itself. So we could, for example, ask in what sense, if any, is a freshly cut flower any less alive than you are now? Now, this helps us answer the question as to what is the meaning of life, because it forces you to interrogate whether or not a freshly cut flower is still alive. And it forces you to really get to grips with the concept of life and death. Now, if a botanist was asked this question, they would say correctly that a freshly cut flower continues to divide its cells after it's been cut, provided it's put in some sort of medium that sustains its life, such as water um, and ideally water with some nutrients in it. So the flower is not dead in a biological sense. It's dying because it's very difficult to sustain itself with a glass of water with some flower food for very long and it will typically die and it can't sustain itself without roots into multiple seasons so you won't get some flowers on your kitchen table that will wither and then grow back next spring that's not how they work so you could say that the freshly cut flower is dying but it's not dead that would be the sort of biologically correct way of looking at it but then to say that it's dying sort of begs the question as to how rapidly does it need to be on its way out of this world in order to be dying you know even if it's got a few weeks ahead of itself that might actually be longer than flowers in your garden that do have roots so it's just really challenging the notions of what it means to be dead what it means to uh be um what the importance of time is i mean a, a past just a sort of a quick aside a past oxford interview question for medical students was at what point is somebody dead now, this sounds like an incredibly dark and morbid question to us, but it's also completely fascinating because the, the, the physiology of death is actually surprisingly complicated. You might think it's fairly straightforward. It's the moment that the heart stops, but it isn't because people can have their heart stopped artificially and then they can be operated on in order to then live a long, longer life. Um, so stopping the heart is not a sufficient cause of death. You could then say that it's when the brain is starved of oxygen, that is the ultimate point of death. But again, there have been many examples of people who've had their brains so starved, such as in strokes, or portions of their brain have been starved at least of vital nutrients, and they've nonetheless continued to live. And it gets us into the awkward sort of question about uh, prolonged vegetative states and whether or not that is death or life. It's really much more complex than you might at first realize. And ultimately, one of the clearest answers to a medical question as to when does life end is that it is a legal question, not a scientific question. In other words, a doctor proclaims the patient you know, time of death was X o'clock, and that is when someone dies. Because it's impossible, really, with any degree of scientific ac accuracy to say so using science alone. So we have to use the law. Anyway, slightly odd aside, but you know, I think these sorts of questions are quite important. Um, so why this, the first thing that we might want to interrogate before we even think about what it means to live a meaningful life is to even assess uh, why we might even be interested. Why is this a question that perennially comes up and it has been coming up since the, since the ancients and all over the world? This is nothing unique to Western philosophy. This is absolutely universal, a question that people everywhere since they've had the luxury to ask such questions have been asking so why why are we so fascinated in this and biologists and anthropologists and evolutionary psychologists have an answer to this which is that it's connected to curiosity 
curiosity is an absolutely fascinating phenomenon. The, the very idea of being interested in something is a survival mechanism. It's a niche that's helped us as a species dominate our environments. Now, we need to unpack that a little bit more. And I've said in this frame here that lack of curiosity kills the Neanderthal. Now, Neanderthal was a hominid species, in other words, a human-like species that coexisted with Homo sapiens um, thousands of years ago. But the Neanderthals didn't survive and Homo sapiens obviously did. Now, Neanderthals were not stupid, much as their sort of legend uh, would have you believe. You know, we tend to sort of talk in, in uh, disparaging terms that someone's a bit of a Neanderthal if they're really, really dumb. But actually, there's no concrete evidence for that at all. Neanderthals buried their dead. They did so with jewellery that they'd constructed. You know, these were not unsophisticated hominids. They were, you know, not somehow much closer to primates than than we are. They were actually, you know, vying with Homo sapiens to be a highly intelligent primate. So why did they die out? Well, there's lots of theories, one of which is that the, the human beings killed them all off, which is highly likely because we're, uh, as well as clever, we're extremely violent um, uh, hominids. Um, the other possibility, and this seems more plausible, is that the Neanderthals didn't have the same degree of curiosity and therefore did not explore alternative environments that they could exploit. Um, the remains of Neanderthals have been found almost exclusively within the the, the uh, area of contemporary Germany. They didn't roam much further outside of that, whereas human beings, of course, were everywhere. And if you think, stop and think for a minute about how human beings got to Australia and how they got to America, well, they did so through not knowing what was on the other side of the horizon, but pushing themselves to go and see if there was something there that could be worth exploiting. It's an extremely dangerous bit of curiosity. I mean, imagine the number of people that must have died just walking across the frozen Bering Strait that connected that connected during the Ice Age, Russia to America. So the people that settled America, the first Native Americans, walked from Asia to America across a frozen land uh, ice bridge, which is just astonishing. Now, you don't do that unless you've got a very difficult situation behind you and you've got some sort of curiosity as to what could be in front of you. And ultimately, they settled America, which is just must have been amazing. You know, they finally, after walking through ice for you know, years and years, they finally settled America. Astonishing, astonishing. And Neanderthals just didn't have that same degree of drive is the inference anyway. Um, so, you know, if you've ever wondered, well, what's the point in landing a man on the moon? Why do we do that? I think it's, it's not, it doesn't really have a point in the sense that it's useful. It's not useful to have a man land on the moon or, or a woman for that matter. It's just part of our nature. It's sort of an expression of our desire to learn more and to be more curious and this is something where natural scientists can help us in the humanities and the social sciences better understand the meaning of life i would argue okay um let's uh, have a little think about who you are and now we're going to get into the realm of how psychologists can help us understand the meaning of life uh, or perhaps i should say the meaning in life now um when someone introduces themselves they'll sort of say oh who are you now this is a a hugely loaded, multi-layered question. Who are you? <laughs> you know, how can you equate yourself? We use the copular verb is and am quite a lot. So I am X, I, uh, I do this. You know, we, we sort of categorize ourselves in this copular sense of X equals Y, I equals a student, I equals, you know, an academic. We tend to sort of put labels on ourselves and come up with this sort of quite restrictive linguistic framework to try and define our essences. And it's really fascinating when you start to interrogate small talk, how much someone betrays about what they find meaningful in life. So what I suggest you do, and this is a little bit of sort of pop psychoanalysis, is that when you are introducing yourself to somebody, do unstructured small talk. In other words, don't say, what's your name? Where are you from? Because then you're telling someone what information to give you. Just allow them to curate themselves, to, to be the purveyors of their own museum, to open themselves up to you. 
and analyze small talk because small talk is incredibly interesting if you allow it to be. So my common sort of opening gambit, if someone just invites me to introduce myself, would be to say something like, hi, my name's Matt. Um, I'm originally from Croydon in South London, uh, and I once tried and failed to roller skate from Land's End to John O'Groats. Okay, now slightly odd opening gambit, I'll grant you. But what am I really saying about myself uh, with that story? What sort of theory of life's meaningfulness am I giving to you? Well, what have I actually told you about myself whilst introducing yourself? What data have I yielded up? Actually, I've yielded quite a lot of misleading data. First of all, I said my name's Matt. Well, it isn't according to the law. You know, none of my legal documents say that my name is Matt, my passport, my birth certificate. They all say Matthew. So my name isn't Matt, it's Matthew, according to the state anyway. So why would I say I'm Matt? Well, because I want to give a, an informalized, shortened version. And that's because I want to ingratiate myself with you. I want to be your friend. So straight off the bat, you know, within a, a microsecond, that this is someone who is concerned with appearances. Now, I'm not saying that if I'd come along and said, hi, I'm Matthew, that that would have made a drastic difference. But I think it can make a subtle difference. OK, so there we go. Straight off the bat, I've told you basically a lie. And I've done so in order to try and decrease the formality. I mean, even things like saying, hi, I'm Matt. I could have said, hello, I'm Matthew. Hopefully you can see that there's quite a stark difference between those two constructions. And they give a very different sense of what my notion of a, a, an important start to a relationship looks like. The next piece of information I gave you was that I'm from Croydon in South London. Now, this, there are a few questions more interesting than asking someone where they are from because it is a magnificently difficult question to answer. What do you say? Do you say the hospital you were born in? Do you say the place that you grew up in? But then you will have grown up in, in many cases in lots of different places. So how do you work out where to say you are from? What's the correct answer to that? It's very difficult to be accurate. And so instead of being accurate, we build a narrative that we find comforting. So the reason that I say I'm from Croydon is because that's where I was a teenager, that's where my parents still live. But also because I know that Croydon is a fairly unprepossessing place. It's a sort of town where no one's got a strong opinion about, it, except that it's maybe a little bit dull. And that suits me just fine. <laughs> OK, if I said, hello, I'm Matthew and I'm from Oxford, which is perhaps more true in the sense of it being accurate, you would probably think of me differently. You would think, oh, OK, this guy's from Oxford. Oxford's that famous city with the big university and he's probably a bit la di da and he's probably, you know, quite proud of himself. And, you know, you might have a different perception of me that I don't want you to have. So I'm trying to sort of twist your perception of me by the data I'm giving and how I'm curating myself. So I say, hi, I'm Matt and I'm from Croydon, which is kind of true, but kind of not true at the same time. And then I finished, I rounded it all off with a total non sequitur about uh, trying to roller skate from Land's End to John O'Groats. Now, there is so much in that little gambit. First of all, it says that, you know, I want you to know something a little bit sort of zany about me. Uh, secondly, um, I want to explain something that I did and failed at doing. You know, if I said, oh, I once tried and succeeded at roller skating from Land's End to John O'Groats, that would just be weird, right? That would just be sort of barefaced showing off. Also, I'm inviting you to continue the conversation. I want, I'm sort of dangling a hook in the water for you to, for you to grab at. So I want you to sort of, you know, get going with a conversation. So there's an awful lot going on in just three lines of small talk. There's nothing small about it. Small talk explains within an extremely concentrated format what I think makes for a meaningful life, which is pretty awesome, I think. So do a bit of psychoanalysis yourself and analyze your own um, small talk to see what uh, what you think of yourself. Um, it also might be interesting to, to reveal something non-essential about yourself. So maybe what your favorite story is. Um, there's some really interesting sort of pop psychology we can do here. Um, you know, for example, why are stories about heroes so popular? Why is it that we perennially get stories about, uh, you know, heroes and villains going back uh, thousands of years? I mean, all the way back to the 
um, <clears throat> the tale of Gilgamesh through to the Iliad and the Odyssey, to the Bible, to the Quran, to, you know, the, the sort of towering totems of uh, human civilization often have a heroic character. In other words, a character who is able to utterly transcend usually his, but sometimes her environment. I mean, to put it more approximately, why are superhero films so popular at the moment? Why is Harry Potter so popular at the moment? Why are gangster films so popular? And what do gangster films have in common with superhero films? Well, gangster films are examples of, of individuals with super social powers, individuals who are able to transcend the limitations of their immediate social environment. In other words, they, they dominate, they have control. Someone like Scarface or, you know, the mobsters in the um, in sort of Martin Scorsese films have absolute unquestioned dominance until they don't. And that's usually the end of the story. <laughs> um, and heroes and superhero films similarly, but marginally differently, have supernatural powers. So it's the difference between supernatural and super social powers. Now, why are these hero stories so popular and, and so timeless in their popularity? Well, it says a lot about our perceived frailties. I suspect that lots of people that gravitate towards those heroic films, and I include myself in that, um, do so because they perceive themselves as vulnerable and frail. And they want to live out a fantasy of being at least momentarily able to transcend the limitations of their capabilities and their environments. So a gangster film, a superhero film, is a, is a method of escape and a way of allowing yourself to transcend. So that, I think, is another interesting thing to consider uh, as giving you an, a sense of what you think makes your life meaningful or maybe limits the meaningfulness in your in your own self-perception of your life. Um, I also suspect that lots of people when asked, what is your favourite story would lie, <laughs> which in itself is highly revealing. In other words, they'll say something that they think the audience wants them to say. So they might say, oh, my favourite story is Hamlet. <laughs> Not because it is, but because they want to seem impressive and clever and, and all the rest of it. I mean, don't get me wrong, Hamlet's awesome and it may well be your favourite story and could legitimately be so. But I suspect that a lot of people, uh, a bit like when they choose certain clothes to wear around certain other people, they are curating themselves. And and that yields, uh, sort of segues us into talking about uh, non-verbal expressions of meaningfulness. You know, how do you style yourself? What clothes do you choose to wear? Why am I wearing this sort of paint splattered shirt? Um, you know, what am I trying to say? Uh, why do men typically have short hair and women typically long hair? Is it a uniform requirement that you wear torn jeans? You know, these are sort of questions about uh, dress, uh, which I think need to be considered. If you're asked, did you dress yourself this morning? Typically, you'd say, well, obviously I did. But then if you cut deeper into that question and you sort of think, well, how many conscious choices did you make about what clothes you were going to wear? The answer for many of us would be none. I adopted a uniform, even though I don't have to wear a school uniform when I'm at home and under lockdown, I'm still wearing a uniform because I'm still trying to conform to some sort of social expectations, some social norms. There's Now, please be very clear, there's nothing wrong with this in the slightest. It's a norm because it's what most people do, nor is it a problem to deviate from that, to my mind. It's just interesting to note that a lot of these things we just take for granted, the clothes we wear, the style of our hair, the accents we use, the, the language we use, the way we talk about ourselves, this is all sort of shot through with habituation, with habits. And that's fine. That's just that's just something to, to, to note. It's not something to judge. Okay, uh, I'm going to move on from that. Now, um, here's a great quote from a, a, a famous Oxfordian called uh, Desmond Morris, um, who wrote a terrific book called The Naked Ape. Um, and in it, he said, frequently we imagine that we are behaving in a particular way because such behavior accords with some abstract lofty code of moral principles, when in reality, all we're doing is obeying a deeply ingrained and long forgotten set of purely imitative impressions. Okay, now... The title of Morris's book, The Naked Ape, gives away his thesis, which is that, you know, if you take off our clothes, we're just primates. <laughs> and we might sort of try and mollify our internal narrative to sound better than that. But ultimately, we are just primates. And we have the similar sort of urges of any other primates. And although we sort of occasionally 
lapse into grandiose thinking, uh, we're not we're not different in in any sort of uh, significant sense from other primates. And so a lot of the stuff that we think accords with lofty code of moral principles is just copying behavior. But again, Morris is not judging us for that, nor am I. I'm not saying this makes you a bad person, I'm not saying it makes you a stupid person. I'm just saying it's interesting to think about. That's all. Okay, um, so let's get into some of the um, other aspects of you. And this time from a much more sort of physiological and anatomical perspective. So again, we're allowing the scientists to, to have free reign in this out of the box session. So how are you doing? Another sort of classic gambit of small talk, almost essential, how are you? For which the correct answer of course is, I'm fine. <laughs> Even if your leg is dangling off, you have to say something completely facile because it's Britain and <laughs> we, we downplay our uh, our frailties um but what are you what sort of what's your physical stuff what matter makes you up now to try and sort of make a metaphor of this have a look at this photo this is the Issei Jingu shrine in uh, Japan and it holds a claim to being the world's oldest wooden building uh, of continuous use uh, now, its claim to that is that it is between 1,200 and 1,300 years old, so a seriously old wooden structure. The big problem with that claim is that it is torn down every 20 years and completely rebuilt using new materials. It's rebuilt according to the precise same design that was laid down sort of 1,300 years ago, but the materials are completely new. Now, the reason they do this is to is in line with uh, Shintoism, which is a, a local uh, religion in Japan. And there, there is a principle within Shintoism of renewal. So to renew the building, they freshen up the materials, but the, sa the same design it is still imposed. So what's the implication for you? Well, the metaphor here is that what makes up you? What is your physical matter? And does that matter matter? Does that actually make you you? Um, how much of what makes you up in terms of your physical stuff, your cells, do you have from when you were born? The answer is practically nothing. Your body sheds its cells in a regular turnover, just like the shrine gets revived on a regular basis, the matter that builds you up is new. There are only a few bits of your body that you will have had from birth. So some of the cells in your cornea, in around your eyes, uh, some of the bone marrow cells in your, in your bones, and for the women watching, the, the eggs in your ova will likely have been from, from your birth. But otherwise, your body just renews itself in a cycle that lasts approximately seven years. So in terms of your physical matter, you're at most seven years old, which is kind of a weird thought. <laughs> and, and also something that's difficult to get your head around. But if you think about it, you know, you're shedding your skin cells as we speak and your hair will be falling out. Uh, and within your body, you will be refreshing your blood cells and you will be doing all sorts of processes that renew you. And yet the design rationale continues and the design the software, if you like, is more important than the hardware. The software is the DNA and it's in all of your cells. And it is like the design of the shrine is what uh, builds you afresh, despite the materials being new. So when you think about it, this building is kind of both ancient and modern. And you're sort of the same. You have an old design map, which actually massively predates you because the software that makes you up the DNA has an extremely long heritage going back millions, even arguably billions of years. But you are freshened up on a constant basis, which is just kind of mind blowing, really, to think about. Um, but it does have an important implication, which I think is quite softening and gratifying, which is that we're basically software, we're not hardware. So when we say we are X, which is admittedly quite a dangerously reductive construction, but let's say for a minute, we are something. If I say we are software, I think that's a good thing, because that means that even when our physical matter disintegrates, we still continue to exist in a meaningful sense. And that's why, you know, even if someone dies, the memory of that person lives on in a, an absolutely meaningful sense. And their genetic code is likely to live on if they have relatives of any description. So they continue to exist in a completely non 
uh, trivial sense, despite the fact that their physical matter has ceased to exist. Uh, and just as I think if this building was torn down, it would still exist in a meaningful sense, provided that the records were kept as to how to rebuild it. Anyway, slightly weird, I'll grant you, and you might all be sort of a bit sort of <laughs> unnerved by all of this. So let's just uh, take a break so that I can tell you what I think provides meaning in my life. And this is pulling together some of the threads we've been talking about so far. Uh, and this is where we can sort of intersect the science and the humanities and natural science and philosophy. So there are these four words, they all derive from ancient Greek, and they sum up what I think makes life meaningful. They are mimesis. Now, mimesis means copying. It's where the words for mime comes from. It's also meme that you will have watched on the internet, um, and it means to copy. And just as Desmond Morris was saying earlier, I think human beings are a species that likes to copy each other because we're in a fundamentally social species. We survive by cooperation, and therefore we like to copy each other. And so I think that's a fundamental point about what makes our lives meaningful is if it if our lives can be associated with other people's lives. I also think mnemonics is important. Mnemonics is to do with memory, uh, not just memory of yourself, but also memory of your group and your society. Uh, and this is what allows you to endure, even when your physical matter is failing you, the memory of you will be immortal in a non-trivial sense. Then there's logomachy. Logomachy is the power of words. And this speaks to how our use of language betrays us and structures our lives. So when I ask someone to introduce themselves and they give some small talk and I'm able to analyze the, the choices they made in language, that betrays the power of the language that they've used. And finally, politics. As a social species, we are, by extension, highly susceptible to, to power structures, those with more power, those with less power. We're very interested in power and we're very keen to try and work out how we can get more power for ourselves. And I think that's another thing that makes a lot of people's lives feel more meaningful is if they can have more power than somebody else. Anyway, as I say, just my theory, and it is just a theory. So please be, feel free to just say, oh, that's rubbish. Um, there's a quote from Aristotle. We don't, we don't have time for Aristotle right now. Um, now, we've been talking a bit about the psychology, the um, biology, the chemistry, the anthropology, but natural science isn't finished yet because, of course, there's still physics to talk about and metaphysics. And specifically, I want to talk about heat and soup uh, because this is what physicists have to offer when it comes to the meaning of life. Now, first of all, heat. Now, when it comes to trying to work out why does life exist, why does biology exist, what laws of physics can explain biology, the answer that physicists usually give is heat, and specifically the laws of thermodynamics. Uh, the first two of which are as follows, that energy is conserved. In other words, you cannot create nor destroy energy in the universe. It is perpetual. From the Big Bang to whatever will finish up the universe, there is a fixed quantum of energy that is immutable, okay? So that's the first law of thermodynamics. And the second law of thermodynamics, which is connected to the first, is that entropy in an isolated system cannot decrease. Now, entropy describes the order of energy. So if you've got energy that has the potential to do work, then it becomes entropic if it loses that potential and becomes disordered. So classic example would be you've got a boulder on the top of a hill, it's got potential energy, then you push it and it rolls and, it, and through its kinetic energy, it produces heat and then just becomes a sort of a smashed mush on the ground. And that is an example of entropy. The potential energy has become heat energy and can do nothing. Uh, well, I mean, you could push it back up the hill, but then you've had to use more energy uh, in order to, to reposition it and so forth. Anyway, entropy will only increase. So disorder of the energy stock in the universe will only increase. It's certainly in isolated uh, systems. Now, the reason that this means that life exists is because life is derivative, according to scientists, from uh, various proteins and biochemical reactions that were exceptionally good at accelerating entropy. So 
it's been hypothesized that life on Earth developed out of geothermal vents in the very deepest parts of our oceans, where heat was applied to various chemicals. And those precursor chemicals produced amino acids and proteins that were exceptionally good at accelerating entropy. And therefore, they were doing the business of the universe. And so the universe helped propagate them. Um, and so this is basically what the what how physicists understand biology. And the implication of this is that there must be life everywhere because the universe is enormous. And given that life is a particularly efficient mechanism for basically wasting energy, then there must be life almost all over the place. We just haven't found it yet. And it leads to a particular paradox called Schrodinger's paradox. Schrodinger, he of the famous cat that both is and is not alive inside the box. But this is a slightly different theory. And this is where he said that we are in ourselves counter entropic. We are extremely complex. We're not disordered. We are magnificently ordered. But the paradox is that we are ordered in order to create disorder. And now this seems like, at first blush, a very depressing conclusion because it essentially suggests that the reason that human beings and all other life exists is because it needs to waste energy. <laughs> that makes it sound like, you know, climate change is not only inevitable, it's us doing our sort of duty, if such a thing can be conceived of, to the universe. Now, <laughs> one thing to be very clear on is that we have shown ourselves time and again capable of transcending our limitations. And we are getting close to utter transhumanism. And transhumanism is when you transcend the limitations of your humanity completely. Now, we're already capable in certain instances of transcending our biological and chemical weaknesses because we can use medicines and we can, we can develop technologies to help us survive in otherwise very vulnerable environments. So we don't allow our weaknesses to hold us back. The final step in the puzzle is to transcend our physics. And physics suggests that we ought to be wasting energy because that's what accelerates entropy and that's what you know helps propagate the second law of thermodynamics. But as a result of mitigation and suppression efforts against climate change, we are even going against our physics. So we are not only transcending our biology and our chemistry, but also even our freaking physics, which is just mind blowing. And so the the upshot is that we should be positive, not negative. We should not see the second law of thermodynamics as somehow just saying, oh, it's inevitable that we will just destroy the universe, but that we can do something about it. We are the species uniquely placed, as far as we know, to stop even the limitations of our own physical potential, which is so cool. I see this as empowering rather than disempowering. Anyway, I promised to talk about soup and specifically primordial soup, which you may have heard of. Now, I mentioned that scientists hypothesized that life began in geothermal vents back in the uh, you know, billions of years ago in the deepest parts of the ocean where there was heat and chem chemicals. And so a couple of scientists called Miller and Yuri basically reran this experiment. They got a big beaker and they filled it with precursor chemicals that they're pretty sure would have existed in the primordial oceans of the time. Things like ammonia and methane and uh, water and they boiled it away. They added some heat, just as the you know, geothermal vents that were expressing uh, the magma from the Earth's crust uh, would have done. And they saw what happened. And what they saw happening was that they produced amino acids in their flasks. So the, the heat and the chemicals they had created more complex uh, biochemistry and the precursors of biochemistry, which is the hydrocarbons and amino acids, which could go on to produce proteins and go on to produce everything else, like, I don't know, uh, Aldi and Dairy Lee and Hopscotch and <laughs> everything else. Uh, so it's kind of mind blowing, but um, some scientists basically cooked life on a hob <laughs> you gotta love those scientists they're they're pretty mad um now we haven't really mentioned metaphysics now metaphysics is the study of where the physical universe comes from and this is where religion tends to slot in because it's all very well talking about these laws of the universe and the big bang and bloody blah, blah but it begs the question as to what came before that what sort of triggered all of this and to this i have no answer i have no clue this could be god god's could be spiritualism, it could be all sorts of forces. And frankly, nobody knows the answer uh, with any degree of certainty. Even the most ardent atheists out there 
can't answer that question. So they shouldn't be too haughty when it comes to sort of saying, well, I know you're wrong if you're religious because they simply don't. Um, but we do have some evidence of some metaphysics. So metaphysics is, you know, the capacity to control the physical properties of a certain portion of existence. Now, of course, if we talk on the level of gods or a god, then we're talking about the capacity to control the entire physical universe. But we can see some sort of more localized uh, evidence of metaphysics in, for example, um, controlling the physical properties of animals. So this man, for example, could be described as a god. Uh, he's called Simon. He is the chairman, president, can't remember what his title is, of the Kennel Club. Now, the Kennel Club is an organization uh, that regulates uh, pedigree dog breeds in the UK. And so his organization determines what makes a dog a dog of a particular category. So if you want to call your dog a Labrador or a Cocker Spaniel, then that dog needs to have its parenting lineage clearly mapped out and it needs to conform to certain expectations of that breed. And those expectations are set out by this committee. Now, what that means is that the committee is controlling the physics of the dogs. And that has certain consequences. So some dog species have had the, the structure of their bones and their skeletons morphed as a result of the uh, requirements laid out by this committee. Uh, some have had their behavior changed. Some have had their, their out, outer appearance transformed over a couple of generations. So this man and his team have metaphysical power. So we can identify something, although it seems incredibly flippant to put it in these terms, but something that comes close to God-like powers, even if it's just of pedigree dogs in the UK. Anyway, so the point of this out of the box uh, lecture was to just throw at you a lot of interesting, I hope, ideas about how we can talk about the meaningfulness of life but without just reliance on philosophers, artists, poets, which you all are and you're highly capable at doing, but to show that natural scientists have a lot of fascinating things to help us with this discussion as well. Um, and I'd just like to end off um, with this paradox of my own, which is that many of my most meaningful moments emerged from managing meaninglessness. Now, that's an abominable bit of alliteration for which I apologize, but let me sort of break it down a little bit more clearly. Um, the most meaningful moments in my life, the things that I, that I go to when I need something to sort of build me up and make me feel better, didn't happen through some degree of artifice on my part. They just happened when I was trying to cope with a situation that I couldn't navigate and I didn't understand. The most obvious example was the birth of my two sons. When that happened, I was just a deer in the headlights, utterly confused, had no idea what I should be doing or could be doing. And it's only with the benefit of hindsight that I've managed to realize that how I manage that situation and how I now have a strong, loving relationship with these boys is what makes that situation so meaningful. The upshot is that you can't necessarily create meaningfulness. You can try and you may be successful, but also quite a lot of the most important things that will happen in your life will just happen. And you won't have a great deal of meaningful control over it. And that's okay. That's not something to be sort of uh, worried about. Um, so the, the key sort of toolkit that you should set yourself up with is, is talking, talking with other people, analyzing. In other words, asking lots of questions. Why do people say hello or hi? Why do people shorten their names? Why do people describe Captain America as their favorite film? That sort of degree of critical analysis will make you very powerful. Engage, talk to other people, listen with empathy to their views. Don't assume you're right, because one of the clearest things is that we are all very ignorant on most things. Uh, be open-minded, but not completely lost. Try and be resolute about certain things. Fight for meaning. Uh, but relish in the inevitable meaninglessness that is all around us. All right. Well, I hope that's been interesting and useful. Um, thank you all for tuning in. Um, if you do have any questions or comments, do feel free to add them to our uh, group discussion uh, or drop me an email. And yeah, look forward to seeing you again later in the week. Dioch. Thanks, everyone.